Hallelujah. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 1. The title of this message this morning is Crossing the Threshold. Crossing the Threshold. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to begin with verse 10, and I want you to listen as we get through and we'll read through verse 17. And before I begin, some time ago when I was studying and seeking the Lord and reading the scriptures, and it became very apparent to me that for all of the great people of the scriptures, and especially for Peter and for Paul, and we're reading about Paul here at this point. Point, and then later we're going to read scripture that Peter wrote. Both those men, there came a point in time in their life where they crossed the threshold. Now, Paul, who was Saul, had a PhD in religion. Paul knew the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures and the law, knew it better than anybody. Now understand this, folks. Paul, who was first Saul, was a Pharisee among Pharisees. We know that. Educated more than any of them. We know that. But in his great knowledge of the law, he could not know God. A person can know what the Bible says and still not know God. You see, the disciples walked with God and still didn't know God. And as the last several years, as I've been seriously studying in depth more so than just what's written but who wrote it you know I used to think that I was pretty knowledgeable about the things of God and, and the scripture and the Bible I used to think I you know I, I, I knew I knew it pretty good and like we said this morning in Sunday school the more the more that you know the more that you learn the more questions you have that you understand that maybe you don't know as much as you think you know and it's just amazing to me how that Paul and Peter, there came a time where there was a threshold that they had to cross to get out of their minds and into their hearts, to get out of a, a religious relationship and into a spiritual relationship. Does that make sense? You see, I fear for so many Christian people today, they have a religious relationship, but not a spiritual relationship. Now, that's not to anybody's fault or to blame or to criticize at all. But to get from a religious relationship to a spiritual relationship, there's a threshold that has to be crossed. Now, in Joshua, don't turn to it, but in Joshua chapter 5, Moses led the people out of Egypt, wandered in the desert for 40 years. Moses died. Joshua was to take the people into the promised land to begin their conquest of nations, of peoples, into the promised land of God. They crossed the Jordan River, and then just before they were going to begin conquering Jericho, God spoke to Joshua and said, before you go now into this conquest, you need to cross a threshold. And the threshold for them was circumcision. You see, everyone that had been led out of Egypt, all the males had been circumcised. But for the 40 years that they wandered in the desert, the new males that were born were not circumcised. 
You see, it wasn't appropriate for that moment in time. God saved, God saved that threshold for his specific timing when it came time for him to once again reveal himself in mighty ways to this new generation. Folks, timing in the kingdom of God cannot be overstated how important it is. Amen. Timing is everything when it comes to the kingdom of God. And God has a time and a purpose and a plan for everything. Now that doesn't mean that we're always in agreement. <laughs> Much of the time, I'm in disagreement with God's timing. Okay? And I, I think that if maybe, if you're always in agreement with God's timing, there might be something wrong with you. Okay? You're not human. Because, because humans get mixed it up. We, we foul it up, don't we? But you see, God has timing. And as you read now, as we read this scripture, I want you to think in terms of Paul emphasizing to the Ephesian church, moving from a religious relationship and understanding of, of destination, predestination of salvation into a spiritual relationship with God and crossing that threshold. So let's read it. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of times, God might gather together in all, in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in Him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of Him, who worketh all things after the counsel of His own will that we should be to the praise of His glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Now that's kind of, you know, that's kind of funky words. Paul is basically there educationally, very intelligently saying, we've been born again when you heard the message of salvation and of hope and in Jesus Christ, you received it, you became born again. God has it, we are his possession, we are his prize. There's going to come a time when he's going to gather us all together one in all, one in Christ Jesus, and Jesus is going to present us to the God the Father, and that's going to be the great gift unto God, even unto Himself. And that's awesome, right? That's cool. That's really cool. Okay? However, let's move on now to verse 15, 16, and 17. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and love unto all the saints. Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. And here it is, verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. In the knowledge of God. It's time now to move from the basic fundamentals of religion, of salvation, hallelujah. But now it's time to move from this understanding of sin and forgiveness of sin. It's ta now time to cross the threshold and move now into the spirit realm that God gives the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him that's God. Now you see folks, understand this. I believe that Paul wants us to pray and ask God to give us the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation in the knowledge of God. You see, that can only come by way of spirit. That can't come by way of intellectual understanding. That can only come through the supernatural process of exchange between you and God in the spirit. That's moving 
from a religious relationship into a spiritual relationship with God. Yeah. And you see, that's what Paul had experienced in his life. When the Lord got his attention on the road to Damascus, Paul fell off and said, Lord, that be you? I said, that's me. Blinded for three days. Went and was healed by the priest. And then Saul at that time said, I have got to get away. So Saul takes off for like two, three years and gets alone and goes back and says, now wait a minute, how did I miss it? How did I know what the scripture said? How did I know what the law said in such a fashion that I was moved with passion to make sure that this Jesus was crucified and killed and then this church thing that's starting, that I kill it also, how did I miss that that was actually the will of God? How did I miss that? He missed it because you can't find it in the black and white. It can only be understood through the Spirit. And the only way you can get the Spirit is to ask the Father for the Spirit. I encourage you, pray. Heavenly Father, give me the Spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. Give me the Spirit of wisdom and revelation, Lord, in the knowledge of God the Father Almighty. And I thank you for that, Lord. Now, at the moment when you pray, and for the next few days or however, you may not feel any different. And you may not ever really feel any different. But there's going to come a point in time where the Holy Spirit's going to quicken that prayer, quicken this scripture, and you're going to need wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God to do what it is He wants you now to do. Or to think. Or to stop feeling. Or to stop doing. Or to become. Can you understand? Can you say amen? Now listen to this as I read. See, crossing the threshold is that point. <clears throat> crossing the threshold is that point when a person becomes fixed in his mind, heart, and soul that from this moment until eternity, heavenly things will rule my choices, my decisions, and the paths I walk in life above any and all earthly, tangible, possessed possibilities. You see, it's a point where that I seek first the kingdom of God because I understand there is no second. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness because there is no second. Well, okay, if you don't, you know, if that doesn't fit your fancy, then you might want to try this. <laughs> you might want to try that. You might want to listen to this. You might want to go to that church. You might want to go over there if that doesn't fit your fancy. No, there's no second. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness because there is no second or alternative. There is none. There is none. So if I don't seek first the kingdom of God in all things in my life, choices I make, decisions that I choose, paths that I walk, thoughts that I think, emotions that I want to experience, emotions that I don't want to experience. If I don't seek God first in all of these things, then I'm going to just become an intellectual, religious, wanderer and I'm just going to wander and I'm going to fall prey to any shiny thing that somebody or something brings up and I'm going to be attracted to that shiny thing That's right. I'm going to be attracted to any sweet thing I'm going to be vulnerable to any traps that might be laid in life by the forces of darkness by the forces of the world even by the forces of religion. I'm going to get to that in just a moment. But if I seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and I establish in my life that there is no second, then 
that I have crossed the threshold and have entered a spiritual relationship and am grafting for and grabbing onto the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. See, folks, here's what I see so much in the world today, and I'm going to read what I spoke about in Sunday school here in just a moment, but you know what? People don't have a need for God in their lives today. That's right. They don't have a need for God. And I've said it. I actually, I actually believe I'm being truthfully as open and as honest with you as I possibly can. My current physical condition, I believe, is timing by God to keep me in need for God. And you know what? If I'm accepting of that, and if I'm good with that, then I'm going to increase in the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. If I'm not accepting of that, and if I want to push back on that, then I'm going to continue to wander. I will be a wanderer, always trying to grasp at something to meet the need, always trying to grasp at something that maybe will fill the void. You see, God has already purposed for himself that he's the only one that can fill the void in the heart of mankind. You say amen? amen. And you see, people don't have a need for God. And, and, and you know, three quarters of the Christians, Christianity is a dying faith. Three quarters of the Christianity in Iraq, in, in Syria, have been either killed, murdered, destroyed in the last 10 years, or they've been exiled. Three quarters. And God is almost completely non existent in Europe. Listen to this as I read it. I talked about it in Sunday school, but I want to read it here. It's specifically what, um, what Adrian Dyke, missionary that was here, I don't know, six, maybe six, seven months ago. She's a missionary to France. Listen to what she, she said in her last newsletter. She said this. She began with saying, God never speaks. Is what my professor at language school said nonchalantly one day in class. You see, this perfectly describes the situation here in Europe. They might know of God, but he is an obsolete, distant, and untrustworthy figure to them. Folks, that's Europe. And we have people who run this country that want us to be more like Europe. They want us to be like Europe. Let me read it again. God never speaks is what my professor at language school in France said nonchalantly one day in class. This perfectly describes the situation here in Europe. They might know of God, but he is an obsolete, distant, and untrustworthy figure to them. And we want to be like them? God help America. Yes. Amen? God help America. Yes. Hallelujah. Pray for our leaders. Pray for them. As much as we want to criticize them, pray for them. Hallelujah. 